I've never believed in the death penalty myself, but when I think about what you do, I begin to understand why people feel it should be the appropriate sentence for crimes like yours. Do you understand that? I do deserve to be executed. Bottom line, I, I ain't gonna candy coat it. I deserve to be executed. About an hour's drive south of Chicago in the state of Indiana is one of America's oldest and most notorious maximum security prisons. The majority of the 1,900 inmates here are serving long sentences for unspeakable crimes. And when I came at you, I wasn't just going to stick you an inch. I was going to run something all the way through you. Camera crew! Twelve are due to be executed on the orders of the state. Hi. For two weeks, I was given privileged access to this dark and forbidding world. Stealing cookies as a, a seven-year-old kid, boy, in school, turned into a 20-year-old killing a cop, landing himself on death row. It went from stealing cookies to shooting a cop. Welcome to Indiana State Prison. My second week at the prison began back on death row. The 12 men here are locked in their cells for 23 hours a day given a single hour's recreation. Taking his is Frederick Bear. His crime, the murder of a mother and her young daughter. Bear could be next on the list to be executed. Is this your exercise routine? Yeah, this is my uh, recreation right now. You want down, Mama? And how's the cap? That's my girl, so. Looks particularly well fed. Always. What's your exercise routine? Well, it usually consists of the leg press machine or going outside or hitting the weights or sitting there calling somebody, your loved ones and your family on, on the telephone. You know, or you can just sit up there like I was doing and just writing a letter, writing my girl over in Germany, so. Is she in Germany doing what? She's in Germany probably right now getting ready to fix supper, so. She, uh, her name is Susan, and she's a, she's a very beautiful person. It must be strange having a relationship when you're, A, so far away, and when you are in the circumstances that you are. Ain't, no, ain't gonna sugarcoat it. Most of us probably won't get off death row. We'll be executed, or we'll die from our appeals running out of, you know, whatever health reasons or whatever. I hope, maybe one day I might get off, but the reality and the truth of that, I probably won't. There's like 16 levels to death row appeals from the start all the way to the finish. And I, that's not including clemency, asking the governor for, you know, please grace. And, uh, Which stage are you at? I'm on 13. I've been here seven years. And my appeals have been going since then, and I'm kind of rapid on mine. That's what tells me I don't know if I'll get off or not. It sounds from what you say and what you admit to yourself that time is running out. Yeah, it is. It is. That's the reality of my situation. When your time runs out, you know, you're handcuffed and you're strapped down. They stick a needle in your arm and they kill you. It might sound cold, but that's the reality. The last man to be given a lethal injection at Indiana State Prison was Matthew Eric Wrinkles.
Convicted of killing his wife and two relatives, he spent 14 years on death row. On the night of December the 11th, 2009, Wrinkles was put to death in this building. Superintendent Bill Wilson, who presides over all executions at Indiana State Prison, is taking me to its death chamber. So these are the steps which an inmate who is about to be executed would take into this, into Cor this area. Correct. Um, there's a, uh, a process or a time frame in which we do everything. But yes, uh, approximately between four and five uh, the night of the execution, we would bring the offender over here, and he would be housed in a uh, holding cell until the time of the execution. As the appointed time for the execution draws nearer, the prisoner is kept under close observation. This is usually a very quiet time for the offender, though. Some make themselves uh, preoccupied with television. Uh, others just sit here and, and meditate and, and are very quiet for the last few hours. My job is one single event, and that's to, to put this man to death. That's, that's very, um, a very surreal moment in time. Overnight, the state has executed an Indiana man convicted of killing his wife and two of her relatives. Matthew Wrinkles died by lethal injection just after one this morning. A jury convicted him of killing his wife, her brother, and sister-in-law inside their Evansville home back in 1994. Police say he wore camouflage and face paint when he broke into the home and shot them. About a half dozen people stood outside the Indiana State Prison in Michigan City last night protesting this execution. He did not try to appeal or ask for How do inmates react right at this at this point? Every every execution that I've been a part of, every offender has done it differently. Most have always has at this point they've they've accepted their 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 station, their position, the the process, and that's happening. Um, one of them, the the first execution that I was ever a part of, the offender turned to us and and apologized to us about having to put us in this place. And he basically said, I'm sorry, you guys have to do this. Do people resist? I mean, there's not very much to resist with handcuffs all around and being tied I, up to the gurney. The only time I've ever had any resistance was one offender was passive. He didn't actually participate in, in movement. He didn't participate in getting on the bed. Uh, so we had to actually carry him uh, from, from the holding cell and onto the execution bed. Are there any, any words exchanged? What, what do you say? Well, we do everything we can uh, to make sure that the offender's comfortable. We do talk to him. We, we make sure that he understands where we're at in the process. Um, we, we constantly are encouraging him to ask questions or just trying to be there for him. Once he's uh, placed on the gurney, he's allowed to give a final statement. An actual death warrant is read to him so that he understands, again, why he's in this position. And uh, at that point, then, we start the execution process. Every week, on average, nine new prisoners arrive at Indiana State Prison. The majority are young men. Many will spend the rest of their lives behind bars. Are you suicidal? No. Are you sick or weak? No. Take meds? 
Are you being treated for med medical, dental, or mental health? No. Here we go. Yep. Lieutenant Gillespie takes me to cell house C, to which some of the new arrivals are assigned. It's the largest block at Indiana State Prison. It holds almost 400 offenders, nearly all convicted murderers. See Charles, 23. Morning. Morning. This is um, Sergeant Zimmerman. Hello. How do nice you do? I'm you Trevor man. McDonald. Hello. Nice to meet you. He's pretty much runs the house. Yeah. It's just after lunch, and the inmates are returning to their cells. I can just see this chap stroking a cat down there. Yes. How did he come by that cat? Well, we have a program, a pet program here at um, Indiana State Prison that, uh, based on conduct history and, and uh, each offender, can put a request in. And they come by it as a privilege? Yes, sir. Oh, definitely a privilege. Oh, yeah. It's, it's not a right, definitely a privilege. And so the thing is, what it does, it gives them a sense of responsibility, help medicate that, so to speak, you know, that, that, that temperament, that stress that they may have throughout the day and not being able to talk to their loved ones or family members. So the cat replaces that which they don't have or lost on the outside. Oh, they're interested in your cat. Hello. Yeah. How you doing? I'm Trevor McDonald. Yeah. Hello. Nice to meet you. Uh, yeah. 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 So you've named him Roscoe. Yeah, she, it's a she. Oh, she. Well, actually I'm sorry. Happened. Forgive me. I, I, I kind of put an order in for her, right? Yeah. When you uh, put, get put on the list for a cat, you ask, uh, they ask you what kind of cat you want, a male or female? I expected a male because I put in for a male cat. So I had bought all this stuff and got it all ready, even named it, because I knew what I never wanted to name him. And then about a month later, I realized it wasn't a boy. I couldn't change her name then. So that's so what rascal she's... it was and rascal it is. Rascal it was and rascal it is. And you think it's changed the way you look at your time here? Uh, well, it, it, it helps me get through my time. You know, like I said, if I have bad days, or you just don't think you can take anymore. Come home and uh, she starts meowing and you know, she's like my kid. I've raised her since she was a little bitty kitten. And uh, yeah. I love her like she's my kid. You, know? you use the word home. Well, this has been home for the last 24 years, so. Really, I've been here over half my life, so I'll be 45 in August. Been here since I was 20. And how long do you expect to be here? Well, right now, I get out in November 2040. 2004-0? Yeah. 2040. So That's a long time. A real long time. I'll be 72 years old. From 20 to 72 is a long time. The worst part is losing the family that you love, all your loved ones. And everybody that ever loved me that never turned their back on me, those are the ones that are gone now. My mom died just a few years ago, and that was probably the worst thing that ever happened to me in my life. The pain of that memory must it, haunt you. It, it crushes me every day. I keep a I keep a photo of her up on my up on my wall, and she's the first thing yeah. I see when I wake up in the morning. May we have a look at it? Yes, you can. Thank you. That's this is my mother. That's your mother. Yes. This is my mother, and this is a, a picture that she had sent me of a cross, and she wrote on the back. She says, "Put this on your wall, where you can always see it. Love, mom." And I keep that right there. Dennis Lear will spend more than 50 years in this prison. That's par for the course for most men here. Coming to terms with that seems almost impossible. There must be people here who stand no chance of ever getting out. True. How do they cope with that realization? I believe it's an individual thing. Once you come to the realization 
and to the fact that possibility there's a chance that I'm going to spend all my entire life in the departments of corrections. And so those of offenders who come into the realization of that and embrace that are the ones that continue to live their lives the best way they can. You talk about their embracing it. You use the word embracing yes. it. Yes. Must, must be very difficult to do that, to come to terms with the fact that this is it. They're never getting out. Yeah, some of the offenders I talk to, especially the young ones, and that's the problem that we have with the, with, with the young offenders, uh, truly have not embraced that. They say it's a time frame within one to five years, uh, a high end of eight years, that, that an offender fully realize uh, of the fact that he's going to be here for the rest of his life. And do people ever abandon all hope and give up when they realize that this is it, this is the end, they're never getting out? Yes. Unfortunately, you have uh, offenders, suicides in the Department of Corrections, uh, and it's predominantly those offenders who realize that there's no more hope. The closest any prisoner comes to life on the outside is the prison barbershop. It has an appearance of near normality. Convicts who work in it are among the most trusted in the institution. John Sawatka is serving life with no possibility of release. Lieutenant Bowen, how long have you been coming here for your haircut? Um, to John, I've been coming for about seven years. Um, he was living in my cell house, so when I came in, it was just kind of a, a normal face to see, so I sat down and he's been cutting my hair ever since. John, is he a fussy, a no, fussy person to have his hair cut or not? No, sir, he's not. The lieutenant is an ex-Marine, so he likes it high and tight. But I was kind of put in check by a, a certain person in his life that doesn't like it real high and tight. She likes it a little bit faded, so I take care of what his wife wants. He has a very lovely wife. So. Take care of it. Be careful. For six days a week, the barbershop is John Sawatka's world. It's his escape. At the end of his working day, the mundane reality of prison life is dormitory F. And here we are. Yes, yes, this is where I live. This is after the dorm. Yes. Yeah, F dorm. You have your, your different uh, weight machines and stuff like that. This is the west side. The west side. Yes, sir. Yes. This is and, my cube. And here we are. West 51. John, this is a privileged, relatively privileged part of this, this institution. Oh, yes, sir. But how do you find the, the fact that you have no no privacy. I mean, you're living cheek by jowl here with everybody else. Oh, no, there's, there's plenty of privacy. You have this wall here, this wall here, and this wall here. That's plenty but, of privacy. But, but that, that's all you have? Yes, sir. That's enough. Yeah. I mean, when, when you realize that that man, whatever he does, or that man or anybody else, has nothing to do with me, and I don't want to have anything to do with them. So this is my cell. This is my cube. This is my life. And that's, that's, that's all I need. And what kind of trouble did you get into? I just, just happened to commit this one murder. It was, that, that's it. That's the only time I've been in trouble. Uh, I got busted for marijuana one time, but that was it. And that was, that was a slap on the wrist. That was a misdemeanor, and that was it. And then after that, I committed this murder, and I, I, I took the lives of two innocent people. And that's, that's all there is to it. I'm guilty. What were the circumstances, John, in which you took the lives of two innocent people? There was, a, there was a, a gentleman that I grew up with, and he knew another guy. Well, beings that I was a dope fan, this man presented pictures of my mother, my father, and my brother. My mother in the yard with her chihuahuas, my father coming out of the ice machine, and my brother getting out of his car in our driveway. And he said, as easy as it is to take these pictures of your family, that's how easy it is to kill. I can kill these people. That was my family. And I lost it. 
I don't know where I went, but I lost it. And I, he says, this is what I want done. And I took the lives of two people. When he said to you, this is what I want done, mm -hmm. what did that mean? To, to take the lives of these two people because he was trying to take over the tickets, the lottery tickets within this here, within Gary. And I didn't know any better. And when he, I thought he was, I thought he was a big time hoodlum. And I was scared. I was scared more for my family than I was my life. I take your point about, uh, about being, uh, you know, worried about the lives of your own family, but um, you could have reported him to the police. I know, the thought never came to my mind. The thought never came to my mind. I, I, I don't know why. I, I don't know why. So, John, what, what, what was the arrangement about taking the lives of two innocent people? What inducements did he offer? Did he, did he offer to pay you? Uh, yes, there, there, was, there was a pay, but uh, it, was, it was minimal. I, I can't remember if it was $700 or $800. It was, it was no money whatsoever. But, you know, I was just satisfied that nothing was going to happen to my family. That was the main thing. You were offered money? Yes. To kill? Yes. Yes, sir. Now, I mean, there's, there's no excuse, yes. I mean, it's... it's what you did is, is, is what might be termed... Horrendous. A contract killing. I mean, you were, you were paid to do it. Yes, sir. I took the lives of two innocent people. Did you know these innocent people? No, sir. No, sir. And how did you kill them? Uh, they were stabbed to death. Wow. Se se $700? Yes, sir. Twelve men on death row are linked by a common fate. One day, they'll formally be told precisely when their lives will end. When that day and that hour arrives, Superintendent Bill Wilson will carry out the orders of the state of Indiana. Mr. McDonald, this is Mr. Allen. How you doing, Mr. Allen? Yeah, I'm glad the weather changed. Glad the weather changed? Yeah. Nice Holmes, you doing all right? Yes. All right. The superintendent makes a weekly visit to the prisoners on death row. The last man he sees today is Frederick Bear, who killed the mother and her daughter. This is the, the last cell on the on the row. Last cell on the block. You can see Mr. Bear has an infatuation with one of England's most famous people. She uh, has been a lifelong love of mine since like 10, 11 years old when I saw her get married the first time to Charles. And uh, I followed her all my life. Why? Because of her heart, what she represents. She's just one of those people like uh, Mother Teresa or Jesus for that matter, you know, just makes an impact on it, on not only one part, but the whole part of the whole world, so. That's my second love. Your cat? Yes. Superintendent, what's your relationship with Mr. Bear like? How would you describe it? Oh, I'd say we have a great relationship um, as far as a superintendent and, a, and offender. With the death row offenders in particular, our destinies are our, our course in life will throw us in the same event. And as a result, um, I think it's important that I get to know these guys as well as I can, or as well as they allow me. And Mr. Bear has been one of the offenders that we've had some uh, really solid conversations about life, where we're at, why we're here, um, how our destinies have actually led us to this point where at one particular juncture, we'll, we'll participate in the same event. 
that event that you talk about is that you will preside over his execution. Correct. Mr. Bear, what do you think of the superintendent having to, having made in a compassionate way, as he described it, that, that cultivated that relationship with you, but in the end, he will be the one to take your life? It's not actually Mr. Wilson's taking my life, so, you know, it's the state of Indiana that's taking my life. He's a good guy. He, he's a fair person. He'll listen, he'll understand, and he'll exercise judgment on what he has to do fairly. He's not discriminatory towards anybody. And I gotta respect that. How do you deal emotionally with the fact that you know you will eventually preside over his execution, his death? I've come to grips with it by virtue of meeting with my religious leaders of, of my particular church and how the church feels about it. Um, I've also asked God for forgiveness for my feebleness in the fact that I may not always understand what his intentions are for us. What I do know is that man has been allowed to create laws. We enforce those laws and up to and including the death penalty. If I don't understand because I can't because I'm human of what God's true intentions are, then I ask for forgiveness for that feebleness. I say this with some trepidation, but it seems that between you both, you've made peace with each other about what's to happen inevitably. Uh, yeah, I don't know that we ever had to say that we've been at peace with one another, but I think we've, had, uh, we've made the effort to understand where each other are in the process and, and how our lives are intertwined. Um, and uh, one, on sing one single day um, will have the most effect on one another. He, he will always be a part of my life and, and I then uh, of his at some point. I, I put myself on the path to put him in a position to do what he has to do. Again, affecting somebody else's life years later by one or several acts of stupidity. And, and undescribable things that I've done in my past, shamefully, regretfully. As much as I love that cat and adore her and almost one shy step of worshiping her, I would give her up to undo what I've done. Thank you. Thanks. Appreciate it. I'd now spent almost two weeks at Indiana State Prison. Convicts here face acres of time and limited horizons, and a routine that can be crushing in its monotony. But that can change in an instant. Morning. Morning. I'd been alerted to an incident in cell house C. This CCTV footage shows a prisoner being dragged along the range after he'd been badly beaten. How badly was the victim beaten up? He was beaten up, I could say, <laughs> pretty bad. You know, when I got there, I actually thought he was deceased because he wasn't moving at all. You thought he was dead? Pretty much, yes, because I had to get his door open. His door was already unlocked because he's a fireman. You know, firemen are out during the day. He was out, and his door was closed at the time. I had to get his padlock off because he was like, get in there. I touched him to move him, and he finally showed me that he was responsive. And one thing about it, his light was out. So whoever did it, they wanted to make sure that we didn't see it. You got to be prepared for anything and everything. That situation yesterday, it could have been me getting walked out on a, on a gurney instead of somebody else. You have to be ready for it all. The prisoners in this block will now be locked in their cells for 24 hours a day. It's an obvious safety measure. The prisoners see it as punishment. I went to see how Dennis Lair, who I had met earlier, was coping. 
Hey, Dennis, how, how are you? Good, how are you? Not too bad. All right. How are things? They're okay, I guess. They've been better. Yeah. How would you describe the atmosphere on the cell block when there is a lockdown like this? People don't like it. I mean, people have their families coming up, and there's, there's no way that they can notify their family and tell them not to come up to visit. Like right now, I've got a, a cousin, her uh, stepson is in the hospital, had major surgery the other day. I don't know what happened. You know, there's no way for me to contact home. And so I don't know if he lived or died. You know, it was a life, life or death situation. But I have to sit here and I have to wait until I come off lockdown to find out what happened. How many times has that happened to you since you've been here? Oh, it's happened a lot. I mean, I've been on stretches back in 90, 90 or 91, where we was locked down for like 11 months straight. How do you cope with being locked down for that period of time? Well, you, you got to deal with it. You it, find something to do to keep you busy. If you don't keep busy, you keep yourself occupied, you know, you're gonna, you might go crazy. You know what some guys do? You know, I'm lucky I've got a TV, got Rascal in there, so, you know, she, she helps me pass my time. I got my guitar. How does Rascal cope with being locked in? I don't think she likes it. I think she wants to get out on the range, but uh, she's sitting at the bars now, so I think uh, I think she wants out, get out on the range and run around. The restrictions apply to her as well. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, she can't come out either. You know, but yeah, she wants out too. It's it's hot on her too. My time at this prison was coming to an end. I was surprised that so many prisoners talked about the possibility of freedom one day. Perhaps it's the only way to survive a long sentence even if freedom is an impossible dream. Before I left, I asked for one last meeting with Frederick Bear in his death row cell. I made a final visit to death row. I asked to see Frederick Bear, who might well be the next man to be executed at Indiana State Prison. His crime still provokes outrage and disgust among the other killers here. Hello, 206. One afternoon in February 2004, he talked his way into a house and killed a mother and her four-year-old daughter by cutting their throats. Bear, who lives in Indianapolis and was arrested there last night, was working in Madison County on a construction site. He says he got lost, and that's why he was near the Clark Hole. When he was arrested, he strenuously denied any involvement in the horrific crime. I'm not a violent person. I cry when a freaking butterfly gets hit on the windshield. That's how soft and sentimental I am, because I love life. Why would I want to destroy life? I was driving up and down that road like the, the witnesses said and everything. Yeah, that was me. I was driving up and down the road. I was aggravated. I was high. I'm not going to lie. But am I a cold, sadistic murderer where I can cut a little girl's throat, a five-year-old girl's throat? I love kids. But that was eight years ago. Hello, Mr. Bear. Hey, how you doing? Hi, good. How are you doing? I'm all right. I wonder whether I could begin by asking you what you remember about your life growing up. 
But it's a normal childhood. I mean, I uh, I was adopted by my dad about five years old. Wonderful guy, you know. Didn't have to, but he loved us anyway. And he adopted me and my brother. And uh, life was okay. It was uh, rough. Didn't know as life went on that uh, a lot of uh, the, the abuse and stuff would start, but alcoholism and stuff played a part in that. And then my sister passed and life sort of fell apart after that. But I mean, I learned a lot of good things before that and, you know, hard knocks, hard lessons, but, you know, we all have a hard life one way or another, so I'm not the only one that's been beat on and all that, you know, so, but it's relatively normal to, to some certain extent, you know. Do you remember the first time you broke the law? <laughs> yeah, I was, uh... I've been a thief all my life. That's all I've been. That's all I've ever been. It's, I'm not proud of that fact, but that's all it is. You know, I'm not going to sugarcoat it for you. I, I'm a thief. I, it's all, I've always been a thief. I started stealing matchbox cars when I was in a kindergarten. And then it graduated, you know, stealing cars, matchbox cars from the store, shoplifting and stuff. And I uh, graduated from that to stealing money. You know, than stealing, just stealing all my life. When you look back, what is it you would say that set you on the road to crime, stealing and drugs and so on? That's a hard question. Uh, after my sister passed away, life sort of fell apart and I uh, kind of gave up. She was like the, uh, a big figure in my life. I uh, sort of just gave up and I stopped caring because, you know, somebody as nice as she was could be done that way. And I ended up being sort of the same people that, you know, did to her what I've done to others to get here. Tell me about the incident that landed you on death row. what I do to get here on death row? Yep. I broke in a house. I, I walked up and under the ruse of being lost, I walked in and uh, I knocked on the door, asked to uh, use the phone. If somebody, you know, if nobody answered the door, then I would break in the house. Nobody was home. So I knocked on the door and a little kid answered the door. And so my first thought was, could I use your phone? You know, throw it off. Her mom came to the door and uh, I asked to use the phone. Being withdrawing from meth and uh, they had done and seen my face, you know, I, I was just really wasn't there. My intentions was to rape her. And uh, I couldn't go through with it but it, I'd already gone too far. And to, uh, to back out now, I know where I was headed. I was headed back to prison. And I, I guess I just thought that uh, if I killed them, nobody would never know. And so I cut their throats. I cut both of their throats. Help me to understand that you went in with the intention of raping the mother, but you ended up killing both of them. 
including slitting the throat of a... Was she four years of age? Three, four years of age? Sounds like you already know more than what I have to tell you. Yes, she was uh, four years old. The mother was 24 years old. Mother's name was Corey, and the daughter's name was Jenna. And uh, I was a cold-hearted son of a bitch. You, you remember their names? Yeah, through my paperwork. I didn't know them then, but I know them now through my paperwork. I know everything about them. Not everything about them. I, I, on my calendar, in my date book, I've got their, on my calendar, marked for their birthdays. Their birthdays? Yeah. I mean, they're a part of my life, and I'm a part of theirs, whether they like it or not. They didn't want me in their life. I intruded in their life. Yes, well, you're, 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 you're not a part of their lives because they have, they have gone on. They've, 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 they've died. They've been killed. Right. I'm a part of their, their, their family's lives. I've killed a little kid. In a most horrendous way. In the worst possible way that could be imagined. You just don't know. I wake up from that still, and it's seven years, eight years almost now. I'll be here on death row. Well, no, it is seven years. I'll be here on death row seven years. And I still wake up cold sweat when I think of what I've done, especially to that little girl. She was at the beginning of her life, and I stopped that. How do you think I feel about that? No, you can't even imagine how I feel. I can't. I can't. I've never believed in the death penalty myself, and I've, I've always been against it, and I probably still am. But when I think about what you do, I begin to understand why people feel it should be the appropriate sentence for crimes like yours. Do you understand that? I do deserve to be executed. Bottom line, I, I ain't gonna candy coat it. I deserve to be executed. By the laws governing this state of Indiana, I deserve to, to be executed over there. And the, and, and the death penalty was put in place for people who did- What I've done. What you did. Right. I mean, there, there's no way around it. If a person does what I've done, they should be executed, bottom line. That's according to the laws of the state of Indiana. I eventually took my leave of Indiana State Prison and the 1,900 men confined within its walls. But the memory of what I saw and heard here will stay with me for the rest of my life.